so today we're going to go to the eighth continent. Um, in the 1950s, scuba gear was invented and the word aquanaut was coined. In the 1960s, as some of you, maybe just me, is old enough to recall, we actually went to the moon and the word astronaut became a household term. But it wasn't until the 1980s that some goofy girl in Australia made a slingshot out of a piece of metal and took that to put a rope over a tree and lo and behold, the word arbornaut became part of our scientific repertoire. And so today we have arbornauts around the world exploring the tops of trees. So that's kind of amazing to think it is so young as a science. It's something in almost everyone's backyard but yet nobody had really ever studied the whole tree. They usually only studied the top when somebody cut it down. So how does a girl grow up and become a tree climber as a profession? All the kids around the world when I give school talks ask me that question and I tell them it's really pure luck. Um, there I am as a very shy, very geeky child with my wildflower collection that I pressed in telephone books. Remember when they were made out of paper? And uh, lo and behold, surrounded in the New York State Science Fair by 400 or 500 boys with their volcano experiments, all blowing up with vinegar, um, I had this little wildflower collection. So I was a devoted collector, and I did take my little tree fort activities to adulthood, and lo and behold, I ended up in Australia on a scholarship, having never seen tall trees in my life except in National Geographic magazines, like our new director, and lo and behold, I had to figure out how do I get to the top of this tree? So that's where the slingshot came in handy, but they were illegal in Australia, so I welded my first one and sewed a harness with seatbelt webbing, and away I went. And there was so much to discover up there that I had trained about 200 volunteers and citizen scientists in Australia to help me, but we still kept finding new things, and a lot of people got nervous that maybe someone would fall, so then we designed this thing called a sky bridge or a canopy walkway a nice bottle of wine in Australia, an ecotourist lodge owner and I sketched this little idea. And so today we have these amazing walkways which allow groups of people to make discoveries in the canopy together. And this is that hit you over the head kind of thing. 50% of the species on the land part of our planet live in the tops of trees, yet we never knew about this until a couple ropes and a few slingshots allowed us to explore this eighth continent and sad to say, less than 10% are really known to humankind. So there's so much opportunity for the next generation to become arbornauts. So that's been a big part of my profession is inventing the tools, using them safely, and then of course sharing all these ideas with kids because we so desperately need the next generation to become arbornauts or at least become aware that we need to look at all of these medicines and insects and pollinators that are up in the tops of trees as well as arboreal cats, so that could be exciting too. And we need to include more people in science. This has been a huge passion of mine is that girl in the science fair surrounded by boys as a kid. Um, I've had a lot of opportunity to take kids who didn't think they could climb and we just adjust a few things and lo and behold, uh, these kids in Kansas discovered eight new species four summers ago because they learned to climb trees, even vaulting out of their wheelchairs. Um, so I really think that science is such a great opportunity to get kids into nature. And I love the fact that National Geographic is now devoted to that opportunity. The kids on the right in this picture, by the way, discovered a new species of weevil in our canopy walkway in Florida, and they're published in the scientific literature at age 10. Hey, you don't need a PhD. <laughs> I'm just like Sandish, my, I think I'm losing my pants now. <laughs> um, but those kids led me to tell you that collaboration is of all ages, K through gray, as we call it in the museum world. Kids can be your collaborators. In this case, in Ethiopia, where I work, the priests are my best collaborators because they are the stewards of the last remaining 3% of forest in this country. So everywhere you turn, I think it's so critical to think about the success of science. And it really wasn't something I learned in graduate school like statistics or chemistry or physics, it was 
bringing trust to your relationships with local people, and it was collaborating with them at the same time. And I tell all my students, those are the two critical things that might still be missing in graduate school. So all important, this canopy world, this eighth continent has now given us a whole new perception of what trees really do for us. Obviously, they keep us all alive. We all know that, but a lot of the public doesn't know that. A lot of business people don't know that. So it's really important to share what we've learned in the canopy. The big trunks store carbon as we pollute it. Obviously, the canopy cleanses our toxic rainfall. It produces oxygen for us. It produces medicines for us. It houses half of the world's biodiversity. And the list goes on and on about all of these amazing millions of dollars of free services that trees actually do while we sleep. So we need to protect big trees. A small tree does not equal a big tree. A sloth cannot live in a seedling. So we need to think about how important it is to preserve our last remaining primary forests. And that kind of inspired me to write a memoir, mainly because I'm so hoping that girls like I was will get a chance to read about all of my mistakes. And maybe they can do better. Maybe they can be the next discovery person and do it in a more seamless fashion than all of my crazy exploits up a tree. My mother still wonders when I'll get a regular job. Um, so that brings me, though, to this important part of the world right now as we live. And I think all of you are so aware that in my lifetime, and maybe some of yours, half of the primary force of the world have disappeared due to human activities. Fires, climate change, clearing, agriculture, logging, all sorts of things are really changing this landscape so rapidly. And it makes me pause as a scientist and say, what have I and my hundreds of colleagues done that wasn't as effective as it should have been? We publish papers, we name species, we get promoted to full professor for these crazy things we put in a journal that nobody reads. Sorry if you're a professor out there. I've been one too. Um, but at some point, we have to say, let's do this a little differently. Maybe we need to start rewarding people who save forests or people who save rhinoceroses and transport them and give them a new life. I think there's just been a lot of very conventional types of metrics in our scientific and academic world. So I've looked hard at my world, and I've taken a big cue from my absolute uh, wonderful mentor, Sylvia Earle, who started an amazing program called Mission Blue. And I thought long and hard and talked to Sylvia at heart and said, why don't I do the same thing on land? Could we have a Mission Green where we identify those very, very endangered forests, which represent the biggest genetic library in the earth, and try to save them, especially in countries that can't afford to pay for conservation themselves, and probably the people can't really afford to donate to conservation themselves because they're trying to feed their families. So Mission Green really is an offshoot of National Geographic in the sense that you all have sent me to about a dozen countries in my career. And now I'm in over 40 countries. But you know what? Some of those countries can afford conservation, like the US and Australia and Europe and Costa Rica and Panama. But a lot of countries like Ethiopia and Madagascar and the Philippines really can't. So Mission Green really is a tribute to my friend Ed Wilson. He and I spent many lunches designing this program before he sadly passed away. And in his latest book, Half Earth, he wrote that list. What are those most endangered habitats? And that list is what is the basis of Mission Green. We would hope to do 10 by 10 by 10. 10 canopy walkways in the 10 most endangered forests, costing a total of $10 million, and hiring 10 to the third women and families to run ecotourism instead of tolerate logging in their forests. And we have some great starts on this program in the last two years. Uh, we have a beautiful walkway in Malaysia. You can look on the last two pages of the May issue of National Geographic and see a much better picture of it than mine is. And um, this walkway not only is funded and open and run by local people, but it just got a UNESCO World Heritage nomination, which is fantastic. So 
That means our grandchildren can have it as well as our great-grandchildren. Australia, we have a walkway built there, but we haven't produced the education programs yet. I have a new wonderful recruit, uh, a girl that grew up in the indigenous village down near this walkway, and I just helped her get her PhD in Gainesville, Florida, and she's going home to be the director of education down there. And, train the women and help run this amazing operation. So we have that success. We have a walkway as a pilot down in Florida. I invite all of you to come and it's finished. It's bringing in $30 million a year uh, to the region. It's hosting a half a million people. And we might not get that much money in a, a walkway in Madagascar, but we can at least really jumpstart their economy. And we're putting in VR at this walkway and uh, remote cams so that handicapped people and old ladies and strollers, which are the ones that live in Florida a lot, like me, um, can come and enjoy the canopy from the ground level. We have a new walkway that just opened in the Redwoods, our most iconic tree in North America. More people have climbed Everest than have climbed a Redwood. I'm sure you're not surprised, um, but it's kind of amazing to think about that. Um, and we're building right now and designing in Madagascar, a country that also has less than 3% of its forests left and no ability to really turn that around without some kind of economic incentive. So if you come from a country that has forest and has an economy that can't really afford to save the forest easily, I would love to talk with you. I've already traced, tracked some of you down who are explorers and we've talked about maybe doing this in your country, but I'm very hopeful that I can use my 40 years as a canopy biologist and my 40 countries of experience to do something that when I'm in the grave and the earthworms are drilling away at me, I will feel content that it's not just publications on my CV, but it's actually saving a few real forests. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>